You ain't got nothing to do. You ain't even planned nothing. Leslie came and leaned over Maybelle, putting her hand on his little girl's thin shoulder. Maybelle, would you like some new paper dolls? Maybelle slid her eyes around suspiciously. What kind? Life in the colonial America. Maybelle shook her, her head. I want Bride or Miss America. You can pretend those are bride paper dolls. They have lots of beautiful long dresses. What's the matter with them? Nothing. They're brand new. How come you don't want them if they're so great? When you're my age, Leslie gave a little sigh. You don't. You just don't play with paper dolls anymore. My grandmother sent me these. You know how it is. Grandmothers just forget you're growing up. Maybelle's one living grandmother was in Georgia and never sent her anything. You already punched him out? No, honestly. And all the clothes punched out, too. All the clothes punch out, too. You don't have to use scissors. They could see she was weakening. How about, Jess began, you coming down and taking a look at them. And if they suit you, you can take them along home when you go tell Mama where I am. After they had watched Maybelle tearing up the hill, clutching her new treasure, Jess and Leslie turned and ran up over the empty field behind the old Perkins place and down to the dry creek bed that separated farmland from the woods. There was an old crabapple tree there, just at the bank of the creek bed, from which someone, long forgotten, had hung a rope. They took turns swinging across the gully on the rope. It was a glorious autumn day, and if you looked up, it gave you the feeling of floating. Jess leaned back and drank in the rich, clear color of the sky. He was drifting, drifting like a fat, white, lazy cloud back and forth across the blue. Do you know what we need? Leslie called to him, intoxicated as he was with the heavens. He couldn't imagine needing anything on earth. We need a place, she said, just for us. It would be so secret that we would never tell anyone in the whole world about it. Jess came swinging back and dragged his feet to the stop. She lowered her voice almost to a whisper. The whole secret country, she continued. And you and I would be the rulers of it. Her words stirred inside of him. He'd like to be the ruler of something, even something that wasn't real. Okay, he said. Where could we have it? Over there in the woods where nobody would come and mess it up. There were parts of the woods that Jess did not like. Dark places where it was almost like being underwater. But he didn't say so. There we go. Thinking about his big fear again. I know. She was getting excited. It could be a magic country like Narnia. The only way you can get in is by swinging across on the enchanted rope. You probably have heard of Narnia. You know, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where they go into the um, closet type place called a wardrobe and they enter a, a new magical kingdom. Her eyes were bright. She grabbed the rope. Come on, she said, let's find a place to build our castle stronghold. They had gone only a few yards into the woods beyond the creek bed where Leslie stopped. How about right here, she asked. Sure, Jess agreed, relieved that there was no need to plunge deeper into the woods. He would take her there, of course, for he wasn't such a coward that he would mind a little exploring now and then, farther in amongst the ever-darkening columns of the tall pines. But as a regular thing, as a permanent place, this was where he would choose to be. Here, where the dogwood and redbud played hide-and-seek between the oaks and evergreens, and the sun flung itself into golden streams through the trees that splashed warmly at their feet. Sure, he repeated himself, nodding vigorously. The underbrush was dry and would be easy to clear away. The ground was almost level. This will be a good place to build. Leslie named their secret land Terabithia, and she loaned Jess all of her books about Narnia so he would know how things went in a magic kingdom, how the animals and the trees must be protected, and how a ruler must behave. That was the hard part. When Leslie spoke, the words rolling out so regally, you knew she was a proper queen. He hardly managed English, much less the poetic language of a king. But he could make stuff. They dragged boards and other materials down from the scrap heap 
by Miss Bessie's pasture and built their castle stronghold in the place they had found in the woods. Leslie filled a three pound coffee can with crackers and dried fruit and a one pound can with strings and nails. They found five old Pepsi bottles, which they washed and filled with water in case, as Leslie said, of siege. Like God in the Bible, they looked at what they had made and found it very good. You should draw a picture of Terabithia for us to hang in the castle, Leslie said. I can't. How could he explain it in a way Leslie would understand? How he yearned to reach out and capture the quivering life about him, and how when he tried it slipped past his fingers, leaving a dry fossil upon the page. I just can't get the poetry of the trees, he said. She nodded. Don't worry she said. You will someday. He believed her because there in the shadowy light of the stronghold, everything seemed possible. Between the two of them, they owned the world and no enemy. Gary Fulcher, Wanda K. Moore, Janice Avery, and Jess's own fears and insu insufficiencies, nor any of the foes whom Leslie imagined attacking Terabithia could ever really defeat them. A few days after they finished the castle, Janice Avery fell down in the school bus and yelled that J Jess had tripped her and she went past. She made such a fuss that Mrs. Prentice, the driver, ordered Jess off the bus and he had to walk three miles home. When Jess finally got to Terabithia, Leslie was huddled next to one of the cracks below the roof trying to get enough light to read. There was a picture on the cover which showed a killer whale attacking a dolphin. What you doing? He came in and sat beside her on the ground, reading. I had to do something. That girl! Her anger came rocketing to the surface. I don't mind. Oh, it don't matter. I don't mind walking all that much. It was a little height compared to what Janice Avery might have chosen to do. It's the principle of the thing, Jess. That's what you've got to understand. You have to stop people like that. Otherwise, they turn into tyrants and dictators. He reached over and took the whaled book from her hands, pretending to study the bloody picture on the jacket. Getting any good ideas? What? I thought you were getting some ideas on how to stop Jan Savory. No, stupid. We're trying to save the whales. They might become extinct. He gave her book back. You save the whales and shoot the people, huh? She grinned finally. Something like that, I guess. Say, did you ever hear the story about Moby Dick? Who's that? Well, there was once this huge white whale named Moby Dick, and Leslie began to spin out a wonderful story about a whale and a crazy sea captain who was bent on killing it. Her fingers itched to try to draw it on paper. Maybe if he had some proper paints, he could do it. There ought to be a way of making the, the whale shimmering white against the dark paper. I mean the dark water. At first, they avoided each other during school hours, but by October, they grew careless about their friendship. Gary Fulcher, like Brenda, took great pleasure in teasing Jess about his girlfriend and hardly bothered Jess. He knew that a girlfriend was something who chased you on the playground and tried to grab you and kiss you. He could no, no more imagine Leslie chasing a boy than he could imagine Mrs. Double Chin Myers shinnying up a flagpole. Gary Fulcher could go to you know where and warm his toes. There was really no free time at school except recess. And now that there was no races, there were no races, Jess and Leslie usually looked for a quiet place on the field and sat and talked. Except for the magical hour, half hour on Fridays, recess was all that Jess looked forward to at school. Leslie would always come up with something fun. She made the long days bearable. Often the joke was on Mrs. Myers. Leslie was one of those people who sat quietly at her desk, never whispering or daydreaming or chewing gum, doing beautiful schoolwork. Yet her brain was so full of mischief that if the teacher could have once seen through that mask of perfection, she would have thrown around in horror. Jess could hardly keep a straight face in class just trying to imagine what might be going on behind that angelic look of Leslie. morning as Leslie had related it at recess. She had spent imagining Mrs. Myers on one of those fat farms down in Arizona. In her fantasy, Mrs. Myers was one of the foodaholics who would hide bits of candy bar in odd places. 
up the hot water faucet, only to be found out and publicly humiliated before all the other fat ladies. That afternoon, Jess kept having visions of Mrs. Myers dressed only in a pink corset being weighed in. You've been cheating again, Gussie, the tall, skinny directress was saying. Mrs. Myers was on the verge of tears. Remember, all of this is just a fiction story that Leslie made up. Jess Aarons, the teacher's sharp voice, punctured his daydream. He couldn't look Mrs. Myers straight into her pudgy face. He'd crack up. He set his sight on her uneven hemline. Yes, um. He was going to have to get coaching from Leslie. Mrs. Myers always caught him when his mind was on vacation, but she never seemed to suspect Leslie of not paying attention. He sneaked a glance up that way. Leslie was totally absorbed in her new geography book, or so it would appear to anyone who didn't know. Terabithia was cold in November. They didn't dare build a fire in the castle, though sometimes they would build one outside and huddled around it. For a while, Leslie had been able to keep two sleeping bags in the stronghold, but around the 1st of December, her father noticed their absence, and she had to take them back. Actually, Jess made her take them back. It was not that he was afraid of the Burks. Exactly. Leslie's parents were young, with straight white teeth and lots of hair, both of them. Leslie called them Judy and Bill, which bothered Jess more than he wanted it to. It was none of his business, what Leslie called her parents, but he just couldn't get used to it. Both of the Burks were writers. Mrs. Burke wrote... <clears throat> Sorry, Mrs. Burke wrote novels, and according to Leslie, was more famous than Mr. Burke, who wrote about politics. It was really something to see the shelf that had their books on it. Mrs. Burke was Judith Hancock on the cover, which threw you at first, but then if you looked back on it, there was her picture looking very young and serious. Mr. Burke was going back and forth to Washington to finish a book he was working on with someone else. But he had promised Leslie that after Christmas, he would stay home and fix up the house and plant his garden and listen to music and read books out loud and write only in his spare time. They didn't look like Jess's idea of rich, but even he could tell that the jeans they wore had not come off the counter at Newberry's. There was no TV at the Burks, but there were mountains of records and stereo sets that looked like something off Star Trek. And although their car was small and dusty, it was Italian and looked expensive too. They were always nice to Jess when he was over, but then they would suddenly begin talking about French politics or string quartets, which he at first thought was a square box made out of strings. Or how to save timber wolves or red wolves or singing whales, and he was scared to open his mouth and show once and for all how dumb he was. He wasn't comfortable having Leslie at her house either. I mean, at his house either. Joyce Ann would stare, her index finger pulling down his mouth and making her drool. Brenda and Ellie always managed some remark about girlfriend. His mother acted stiff and funny, just the way she did when she had to go up to school about something. Later, she would refer to Leslie's tacky clothes. Leslie always wore pants, even to school. Her hair was shorter than a boy's. Her parents were hardly more than hippies. Maybelle either tried to push in with him and Leslie or sulked at being left out. His father had seen Leslie only a few times and had nodded to show that he had noticed her, but his mother said that she was sure he was fretting, that his only son did nothing but play with girls, and they were both worried about what would become of it. Jess didn't concern himself with what would become of it. For the first time in his life, he got up every morning with something to look forward to. Now, all summer, he had something to look forward to, and that was running but now he has something more important, um, something really special, which is a friendship. Leslie was more than his friend. She was his other, more exciting ha self, his way to Terabithia and all the worlds beyond. So again, this is not um, romantic. This is just a really special friendship. Terabithia was their secret, which was a good thing, for how could Jess have ever explained it to an outsider? Just walking down the hill toward the woods made something warm and liquid steal through his body. The closer he came to the dry creek bed and the crabapple tree rope, the more he could feel the beating of his heart. He grabbed the end of the rope and swung out toward the other bank with a kind of wild exhilaration and landed gently on his feet, taller and stronger and wiser in that mysterious land.
Leslie's favorite place beside the castle stronghold was the pine forest. There, the trees grew so thick at the top of the sunshine was veiled. No low bush or grass grew in that dim light. So the ground was carpeted with golden needles. I used to think this place was haunted. Jess had confessed to Leslie the first afternoon that he had revved up his courage to bring her there. Oh, but it is, she said. But you don't have to be scared. It's not haunted with evil things. How do you know? You can just feel it. Listen. At first, he heard only the stillness. It was the stillness that had always frightened him before. But this time, it was like the moment after Miss Edmonds finished a song. Just after the chords hummed down to, dis to silence, Leslie was right. They stood there, not moving, not wanting the swish of the dry needles beneath their feet to break the spell. Far away from their former world came the cry of geese heading to southward. <coughs> southward. Leslie took a deep breath. This is not an ordinary place, she whispered. Even the rulers of Terabithia come into it. At only at times of greatest sorrow or of greatest joy. We must strive to keep it sacred. It would not do to disturb the spirits. He nodded and without speaking, they went back to the creek bank where they shared together a solemn meal of crackers and dried fruit.